Patrick Williams turned 23 yesterday, and with his birthday passing, we're going to take a look at the best month of Patrick Williams' career and how we can make that month the whole entire 2024-25 season and what the Bulls and Patrick Williams need to do to consistently unlock the best versions of Pat, uh, Patrick Williams. With that said, we're also going to look at Iota Sumo and Kobe White and how they keep being mentioned as potential trade pieces for the Chicago Bulls, even though me and many Bulls fans don't think the Bulls should be looking uh, to trade them yet. And lastly, we're going to look at some teams that have been named as that could get desperate and make a trade for Zach Levine midseason. We're getting to all that and more right after this. You are now tuned in to Chicago Bulls Central, your number one place for all Chicago Bulls news and content. What's going on, Bulls fans? Welcome to another episode of Chicago Bulls Central, your number one spot for everything Chicago Bulls related. I'm the host, Terry Hayes, but more importantly, you guys can follow the channel at Bulls Central Pod on every social media platform we happen to be on. With that being said, let's go ahead and get into this content for today. So I want to start off with Patrick Williams. First off, happy belated birthday to Patrick Williams. Shout out to him for turning 23 years old. But with that said, of course, the Patrick, Patrick Williams got his contract this past offseason leading a lot of Bulls fans to talk about, did Patrick Williams deserve it or not? What's going to happen over Patrick Williams? What does he need help? I've even had a video on why there's a lot of pressure on Patrick Williams, even though some Bulls fans seem to think just because you get your contract, it means that there's no pressure on you. I don't get those things at all. But Patrick Williams is in a, in a, in a spot right now to where he's going to be fighting. Like, and I want to make no mistake about it, right? Patrick Williams has shown himself to enough be a role player in the NBA, a starting level role player at that. The question is, though, at 23 years old, you don't want Patrick Williams to just be a role player. You want, and most Bulls fans, especially when you pair in the fact that he was drafted 24th overall, him to be more than that. And how do we get Patrick Williams there? Well, I want to talk about something here. Patrick Williams, uh, the best month of his career, in my opinion, came down to December of 2024. Over that month of December, Patrick Williams played, uh, I'm sorry, he uh, scored 14 points per game, did that on 52% shooting. 50% 50% shooting from three, taking three and a half three-pointers per game. Um, he also only took 10 shots per game, which again, that's been Patrick Williams' whole career. 10 shots per game is basically what he's been averaged, but it was how he got the shots. That's why he was able to average the 14 points per game. Over that course as well, he also averaged 4.4 rebounds. It's an okay number, right? I, I, it's, it's a solid number considering he was next to Vooch. Have to look at what Vooch was doing over that time. Uh, two assists per game as well. Basically a steal and a block per game. Only 1.1 turnovers per game. So that's the best and probably most consistent month we've seen from Patrick Williams over the course of his, of his Chicago Bulls career. Over, that, over the course of that month of December, he had six times scored over 15 points. And then he scored three. He had three games in which he scored over 20 points. That's really good. Patrick Williams in that time period was attacking the glass more oftenly, getting, cutting more oftenly, getting easy buckets at the rim. That's, that's one of the times we've seen Patrick Williams catch some bodies at the rim ultimately as well. And why, what can he now do to kind of make that and get that close? Now, I think that a Patrick Williams that has those averages over the course of an entire NBA season is a pretty damn good step up for a, for a player that has been right around 10 points per game the majority of his career that's still probably going to be the third or even fourth option on offense if he can get to that. that that's a really good number for a season. But what went into that? That's when the Bulls were down. DeMar DeRozan, first part of that. Zach Levine was out for, for a large part of that as well. And the ball, the ball was moving more freely. Actually, the Bulls were playing with one of the quicker paces that they play with over the course of last season during that month of December as well. These are all things that we expect the Bulls to try to do more consistently now with Josh Giddy being the point guard is end up being a younger team in general. They're trying to play with a quicker pace. They're trying to get in transition naturally easier. They're trying to move the ball around a little bit more. Those are all things that Patrick Williams' game can benefit from. Now, I won't say just like I do with everything else that it's a foregone conclusion that, oh, just because we play faster, that automatically means Patrick Williams are going to get more out of Pat because it still comes down to what's between Patrick Williams' ears and how he gets to the point of consistently giving that effort. Again, now we've seen players, some players need the ball more often and that get, keeps them engaged and involved on the offensive side of the ball. For a large part of Patrick Williams' career, he just hasn't got, gotten those shots and those opportunities. Now, when you look at it, of course, things came crumbling down for him in January where he, uh, he, uh, he only averaged 24 minutes per game. That's when the foot injury started bothering him, and he really only 8.4 minutes uh, over that time period, and it just wasn't a lot, a lot for Patrick Williams in that time. 
The month of November as well, 8.4 points per game. He only got 7.3 shots per game. The month of October, six shots per game. So I think that we're seeing with, of course, if you're, if you are more, if you get Patrick Williams more involved in the offense, he becomes a more engaged player. Now, I'm not saying that that's optimal. You want somebody who's going to attack and give consistent effort regardless, but that is something that I think coaching, and I think that having Josh Giddy here as well can help Patrick Williams. Like, Giddy's going to be one of those point guards that if you're cutting and you're, and you're moving to the rim and you have an angle, he can get you the ball. And that's hopefully that's something that comes out in training camp for the Chicago Bulls team. It's just that move, move, move without the ball. We've talked so, so much about that over the course of Billy Donovan's uh, tenure here with the Chicago Bulls is just being more consistent at, at getting movement without the ball from your team. And that's what it comes down to. We'll see what happens in that one. You know, again, that month of December, the Bulls went 9-5 and five over that month as well. And, you know, it, it was a solid month for them. Kobe White averaged 22.6 points per game. Uh, you know, that, that over that time. And the Bulls played pretty good over that time period. It was a 14-game stretch, and Patrick Williams was really good and engaged in that. Now, this is a new team with a new makeup, with a new play style, hopefully. And we'll still see, like, there's still those talks and conversations of Jalen Smith maybe trying to win that starting center position. And if that happens, that's definitely going to be a team that's getting up and down the court a lot quicker and even getting those, those opportunities more naturally, right? The Bulls were 28th in pace last year. And so... Having a, a team that your point guard is going to be getting a lot of rebounds as well. They're both your guards and Kobe and Josh Giddy, which are both really solid rebounding guards, is that you're, you're creating more natural opportunity to get out in transition. And if Patrick Williams can get in that rhythm, then, yeah, hopefully we can see that December Patrick Williams become a, the more consistent Patrick Williams that we see. But it's still up to Pat to show it. And Pat is a player that is, is really still polarizing amongst Chicago Bulls conversations, right? You have your, your Bulls fans that still think that Patrick Williams has this, this star level upside. You have Bulls fans that think he's a bust already, right? Even though, again, what he's shown already is to be at least a solid uh, NBA starter that's going to be able to stick around the league for a long time. But again, you know, that you have those things. So it's a, it's a large spectrum when it comes down to Patrick Williams and how Bulls see what he can turn into. But it all comes down to Pat wanting it, man. And, you know, yeah, there are going to be more opportunities now, naturally. Still not as many as what I think some people make it out to be. You still got Kobe. You still got Zach, who are going to get a huge share of the shots here with Chicago. But the ball, the, the play style of the Chicago Bulls changing now to the point of it being a thing where you're, you're, you're moving in and getting the ball quicker up and down, that's going to hopefully create more opportunities for you also. So, that's something that you want that we are going to see from Patrick Williams to see what we can get out of him, what it ends up turning into for Pat. And um, yeah, I mean, <sighs> expectations, right? What are my personal, right? Because I can't speak for anybody else. My personal expectations for Patrick Williams at this point really come down to just this one thing: is showing that you are somebody that the Bulls can build with, that you can be consistent in whatever your role is, and that just that, and even defensively, Patrick Williams is a really good on ball defender. But even then, it's not always consistent for Patrick, Patrick Williams, right? So we got to see a Pat that shows that he wants it. And I think that that's kind of the more thing that I'm looking at. And I think I'm in the, like the second year, maybe even third year in a row now, of saying that same thing when it comes down to Patrick Williams, is that he has to show that he wants it, man. And I just have not felt that from Patrick Williams. Um, you know, he's, he seemed to be a player that, it, you know, passive P, right? We've called him passive P uh, for years now at this point, right? So. Um, you know, we're going into our fourth season covering this team of this channel being a thing. And I think Passive P was like something that we started calling Patrick Williams maybe six months into the channel being a thing. So like it, it Pat has so much potential and he still has potential. You guys know I'm not somebody who likes to give up on players while they're still extremely young. And Patrick Williams is a still a very, very, very young player. But the question is, is that all the potential in the world doesn't matter if you don't realize it. Potential ain't one a goddamn thing, especially not for this Bulls team. So it takes more than just potential. And hopefully Patrick Williams can start flashing more than that, just that potential. But we'll end up seeing, man. But let me know what you guys think down below. With Patrick Williams, talked about the month of December, but even outside the month of December. With how you look at how this Bulls team has changed. Also with players behind him now and Modis Busillas, who eventually shapes up to be a four. I think he's going to be a three his first couple years in the league. You still got Julian Phillips there. We don't know what the Chicago Bulls are going to do in the draft, right? It could be the best player on the board for them is a power forward, right? Which talk about something about in that in regards to that later down the road. But like, 
it, it's the season where Patrick still has to show that he, what he can be, right? And so we'll end up seeing what that is. But you guys can let me know what you think on all that down below. Now let's get into the next topic. So you guys know I've been kind of going over these Kobe White and Io DeSumo trade conversations, trade ideas. One popped up over the last couple of days of seeing sending Io DeSumo to the Milwaukee Bucks for Pat Connington and a 2031 first round pick swap, not even a pick outright. And while, you know, reading that article, which I was going to come in here and break down that trade idea, how it could help the Bulls, whatever. But really when it comes down to, this comes down to the thought process between why or why not the Chicago Bulls should maybe consider moving off of Kobe White and Io DeSumo before their, their next contract extensions, which after this season, they only have one more year left on their deal. The summer of 2026 is where the Bulls will have to extend Kobe White and or Io DeSumo. So that's just where it comes down to, right? And with those extensions pending, the question is, is that should the Bulls take advantage of them being on cheap contracts, them having great value in the league before they have a chance that for that value to tank and take advantage of that, of getting some assets back? Because many people look at this and say, hey, what you need while you're rebuilding and going younger is the most draft assets possible. And I understand that mindset, right? And so the question is, is when it comes down to it, is that what are the Bulls trying to do, right? And I think that there's some confusion over what the Bulls are trying to do here. There are some Bulls that think the Bulls are tanking, right? Because they're going to be a bad team. It automatically means they're tanking, and it doesn't. It means that they've gone younger, they're focused on development, and they're trying to see how these young pieces are going to fit before. I don't think they're tanking, actively tanking. I don't think that's where the Bulls are right now. Of course, you still have your Bulls fans that think that this Bulls team is going to be a 40-win team. I think those people are absolutely crazy. That's my personal opinion. But we'll see. The season will dictate and tell who's on the right side of history with that one, right? But moving Kobe and or Io DeSumo before the next contract extensions isn't an impossibility. I don't think it's what the Bulls should do, but it is something that could happen. And I do think there are some specific scenarios in which it could, right? And again, this is not to say that Kobe White or Io DeSumo are bad players. This is more so looking at the outlook and place of where the team could be that could lead them to trading some of their best value contracts that they have. I've talked about it. I think Iota Sumu, with making only, what, a little over $7 million over the next two seasons and what he gave production-wise last year, he could be one of the most valuable trade pieces on the market, period. Now, that does not mean I think the Bulls should move him, but I think that. And, Col and Kobe White, to an extent, as well in that. The Bulls are a team that have waited to strike on a lot of pieces, which has led a lot of Bulls fans to want the Bulls to strike on everything the moment that their trade value is highest. That's when you strike, yeah, Kobe's good, but he's not great, whatever. That's the mindset that people have, right? And I understand that because the Bulls have missed out on potentially a lot of assets by not moving off pieces earlier. We've talked about how the Bulls had a reported deal on the table from the New York Knicks the year after he signed his contract extension at that first trade deadline that they're never going to get back to. It was like R.J. Barrett, two first-round picks unprotected in a pick swap or something like that. It's been like two years. I don't remember it off the top of my head. Of course, we heard the Alice Caruso thing, that the Bulls got offered a pick that ended up in the top 10, even though had that team got Alice Caruso, theoretically, it wouldn't have been a top 10 pick, but that's out there. DeMar DeRozan, Bulls could have got something at one point for DeMar had they made him available. Andre Drummond, two second-round picks offered by the Philadelphia 76ers that they didn't take. He ended up signing with the Sixers outright. You got nothing back, right? So all those things happen. And so the Bulls fans that look at this now and say, we have two players that are good that are good, that have to potential to even be better than good, that are on reasonable contracts that teams would have to give us first round picks because it does, it takes nothing to match those contracts. What, what is the world in which the Bulls would do that? And I do think I've, I've brought together three different scenarios in which I think that it's a possibility. Still not saying it's what I want the Bulls to do. Listen to this because some of y'all don't comprehend. Uh, it's not what I'm saying that the Bulls should do. It's situations that I think realistically could, the Bulls could evaluate it. First off, is that heading towards the 2026 trade deadline, which this year is the 2025 trade deadline, so I'm basically saying next year's trade deadline. With Io and, DeSumo, Io and Kobe, at that point, having one and a half years left on their deals, right? At that point, could the Bulls at that point then look at it and say, hey, let's move off of these. Let's move off of these deals. Um, if they don't have a clear path, if let's say the Bulls are still a team that this young core does not work out, 
that they still are a team that are struggling to get to that 28 wins or whatever else it is. But you have two young pieces that are hopefully at that point still playing well, right? And Kobe White and Io assume that they are still playing well, that you then say, hey, we can get a couple of firsts back, maybe each for one of these guys. Yeah, some of them are going to be protected. We can do that. Let's go ahead and do it because right now, Kobe White, I would assume at that point being closer to 26 years old, I think, let, let's, we don't want to sign them to contract extensions and wind up right back where we were with Zach Levine. Well, we have to sign them to keep them. And then at that point, we don't really have, we're not at the place to really build a team around, around them or with them that really can't contend, right? This is a, just a bad basketball team. That is a world in which it happens. I think that that could happen. And again, I think I said one and a half. Technically, at this year's trade deadline, they'd have one and a half. So basically, they'd be expiring contracts in 2026 uh, free agent uh, uh, trade deadline. So that would then allow the teams to have the bird rights, right, to go over the cap to sign Kobe White and or Io DeSumo, whoever, whichever ones they get. And the Bulls would then be theoretically getting back draft pieces back for two of their promising contracts because of those things, right? Those are opportunities. I do think now I don't think that the Bulls are going to be that bad, but let's just say that there is a world if the Bulls are that bad. By next year's trade deadline, hell, maybe even by this year's trade deadline, if this just does not work out, the Bulls could look to pivot and, and do some things. Maybe on one of them, not both of them, but again, that's the thing. Let's say then another scenario that could happen. One or either of them takes a step back. Let's say, or, or maybe just doesn't take another step forward. Maybe Kobe, Kobe White, this is just who he is. And while that is a very damn good player that is aggressive and can fill it up and is going to have some days where he absolutely wins you basketball games, but maybe they look at that and say, yeah, but we can find another 19-point-per-game score. I do think that that is a scenario. If neither one of them really takes another step, that that's a possibility. Again, not saying that it's a sure thing, but it's a possibility. And at that point, the Bulls would have to then evaluate who Kobe and Io are if they never make another step, where this team is, and if the potential of getting other draft picks that are higher up with some of the deep drafts that are coming up gives them a better opportunity to build something more sustainable over time to get them to their goal than paying Kobe White and Io DeSumo near max level money if they both keep this track going. So that's another thing. Then there's a, the, the last scenario in this, which I do think is a, a chance of this. Let's say that the Chicago Bulls are bad this season. And in the 2025 draft, the player that they evaluate as the best player available is a shooting guard then I do think in that world, then, there's a chance in which the Bulls look to move off Kobe. I'm not saying immediately, but we've seen it happen before, right? One of the things that caused Portland to go ahead and move off Dame, they got scooped, right? We've seen that over the course of the history of basketball. Is that sometimes when you draft somebody and they're at a certain position, it makes more flexibility with some players that maybe you would have wanted to keep, but because you have this young guy who, set, who reset your timeline at that position, it could cause a, that, that, that stir there, right? So, for example, Dylan Harper in next year's draft, shooting guard, 6'5", 215 pounds, 6'10", wingspan, a guy that has a really good skill set. He can score from three. He can score with the ball in his hands. If the Bulls wind up, and this is, again, this is a, a very big if scenario. If the Bulls wind up to where that's the player throughout their draft process, whatever, that they feel is the best player on the board where they draft at, that could open up that scenario. Now, that means that you are then a re again set resetting your roster to go younger, but that is a possibility. Like Dylan Harper there, who's drawn comparisons to Kobe White and James Harden. Like those are some of the comps that have gone to him, right? Um, a stronger Kobe White is what uh, some of the draft boards have him listed at. Uh, Ace Bailey, another guy who I think is, is he's going to be more of a of a three, right? At that point, you're looking at maybe him and Modis Busillas being your long term three and your four. But again, there's some things in that. VJ Edgecombe, right? Another guy. A guy who can play on the wing, 6'4", right? So it depends on who you draft as well. And I think that that is something that if the Bulls end up keeping their first overall pick, their first, their first round pick in this draft, this first overall, we know who's getting drafted, right? But their first round pick, then I think that that's another thing that could change the course to where you're then saying, hey, and they could do it in that draft, right? Let's say that the Bulls do get Dylan Harper in the draft. I'm just, again, a scenario. They could very well look and, and get on the phone and say, hey, who wants Kobe White? Who's willing to give up a lottery pick for Kobe White right now, right? We'll give up a future first-round pick swap. Who's willing to do that? They can completely set the table and go younger at that point. Or they could say, hey, Kobe can still be the starter while we're waiting on a Dylan Harper to develop. But, hey, that means that we gotta, we're going to have another guard off the bench. Who wants Aya, right? It could be, be those type of things. And that is, I think, a front office doing their due diligence and then making the most out of it. 
that's a case. So I, 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 I'm on the fence that I do not want to see the Bulls just look to trade Kobe White and Io. I think I've made my, my, my state clear on that. But there are scenarios in which that could present themselves over this Bulls retooling rebuild that could make it kind of make the most sense. But let me know what you guys think down below. Whether you're on the side of you, you want to see Kobe White and Io DeSumo or you think the Bulls should be exploring those trades or not, what are some scenarios that you think it could make sense for the Chicago Bulls to maybe explore that? Even if you're on the side of the fence that you don't want to see them traded, let's use our critical thinking caps. I want to hear some good, good ideas and good thought processes from you guys on this one. With that said, let's get into the last topic for today. So there was an interesting article that came out that listed some teams that could become desperate uh, during the season and that could lead them to pivoting to making a trade for Zach Levine. I'm going to focus on those teams here. It was an article that, that talked about teams that are completely out that could come back in. I'm just going to focus on just the teams that could get desperate here, right? And I think that there's, there's eight teams listed here. I have my own varying degrees of thought process on it, but let's go ahead and talk about it. First, the Atlanta Hawks. Now, this is an Atlanta Hawks team that is still sitting kind of in two worlds like the Bulls have been. They still, they still have Trey Young there, who is a young piece. They still have a lot of their veterans and Clint Capella and other players down there. But they also have the ability with Jalen Johnson, uh, 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 Risha Share, to maybe decide to go young. Now, if the Hawks and Risha Share or whatever else, if they decide to say, no, we're going to make a go for it. We want this team to be in the playoffs. We want to try to get back to where we were in the Eastern Conference Finals at some point, And we think that we can make a move to get there. I do think the Atlanta Hawks could be a team. They have the contracts that they can use to match up with it in Bogdanovich and others if they if they look at um, Zach Levine being the guy that they feel can get them the best opportunity. The Miami Heat. Again, we've talked about the Miami Heat heavily. They can really make a move if they wanted to. The question comes down to if they want to move off some of their assets to do that and how they feel about the pairing, the long-term pairing of what it would be then at Zach Levine, Bam Adebayo, and the other young pieces that they have there. That's another one. The Houston Rockets are an interesting case because the Houston Rockets are a team that I do think are going to be trying to gun for everything for the playoffs, but I think they're going to try to do it with their young players unless, like I said, as they, uh, we talked about in yesterday's episode, Jalen Green, Alfred Sengun, these are two players that did not get extensions, and reportedly they could look to move one of those guys if they, if they don't fit together. That's an if they don't fit together, but we'll see there. The Denver Nuggets, this is a team that I think as well could, could be looking to make a move. For that, I don't know if that's Zach Levine. The Orlando Magic we've talked about. This is a team that's defense is legit. Their offense needs work. And maybe they look at their defensive system and, and the framework they have there and they think that they can weather that. Unlikely I would put them in. The Golden State Warriors, I'm, I'm not, that's on this list from Pimpin' Ain't Easy. I'm not going to take them because they had the chance to get Zach Levine for Chris Paul as a swap. They didn't take it. The Lakers, we all know the Lakers could be, get desperate at any point in time. And that could lead them to making a trade. The biggest question is, is will they finally be willing to give up on an Austin Reeves? Because I do think that that's what it would take to get Zach Levine in here. And then the Clippers, we talked about them heavily. Steve Ballmer is a guy that he would do anything to make his team, his franchise a winning franchise, especially with putting butts in seats in that new arena. Zach Levine being from California, that could be an issue as well. So to recap, the Atlanta Hawks, the Miami Heat, the Houston Rockets, Denver Nuggets, Clippers, Orlando Magic, the, L the, the Lakers and the Golden State Warriors are all teams listed as teams that could get desperate to make a move for Zach Levine by this year's trade deadline. So watch those team seasons. Watch how they go. Watch what kind of are the limitations of those teams. And if, a, if they could use a 20-point-per-game score, that can end up helping their run towards the playoffs. Let me know what you guys think on those teams down below. We may get do a, a, a nightly video to do a deeper dive on some of the trade ideas with those teams. So stay looking out for that one. Make sure you guys are following us at Bull Central Pod. You can send us any feedback, questions, comments, concerns, bullcentralpod at gmail.com. Lastly, if you want to leave a text message and our voicemail for the mailbag, the number to do so, 773-270-2799. We are the number one spot for everything Chicago Bulls related. That's thanks to you guys. And like I like to end every episode on, go Bulls. Love you guys. See right if you can, y'all. Peace. This has been a presentation of the Break Break Media. Media.